Okay. Live. Yeah. So I guess we're live. Cool. Um, welcome here, Sahar. Thanks. Awesome to have you here. And I, I realize you just um, finished the Women in Data Science Conference, right? What, what was that about? Yeah, so on Tuesday we had uh, Women in Data Science Stockholm Conference. Uh, it was a virtual event. Mm. Uh, it's an event uh, that is annual uh, and uh, it's based on an initiative started by Stanford five years ago uh, to inspire uh, women in, in, in the field of data science, AI and machine learning and uh, to also build a community uh, and uh, grow people in, in, in this path, mm -hmm. uh, especially like uh, focusing on women. Mm -hmm. And uh, we started uh, in Stockholm uh, three years ago. And uh, we had our first event uh, in 2018. And uh, like every year, it started growing. And this year... Uh, <laughs> corona year. Yeah, yeah, yeah Corona hit us. Uh, so just like a few days before the event, we had to cancel it. It was mm. uh, supposed to be on uh, Friday the 13th of in, March. In March, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, and that but was then, right when Corona started to... Yeah, exactly. To explode a bit. Yeah. yeah. And previously we had like physical conferences in, yeah, exactly. in, in Stockholm. We had uh, physical conferences. Uh, I mean, it brought uh, like a lot of challenges to find out what is a good way of uh, having uh, good content, engage, engaging uh, uh, conversations and like, you know, having networking happening also for women. Mm. Uh, and But also meant like a lot of people outside of Stockholm mm. could join, not just Sweden, but also like uh, around the world. Mm -hmm. uh, which was super nice. And we are really, I mean, I have a really high bar of like, you know, what we, uh, what we put out. Yeah. Uh, I mean, my co-organizers co as well, but uh, I think we feel quite content with, uh, with the event. So it just finished, was it on Tuesday now? Yeah, it was yeah. Tuesday. So we had around 220 people uh, that uh, attended and stayed for the whole event. Mm -hmm. Uh, and uh, we had uh, three invited speakers, uh, uh, very good uh, experts uh, talking about um, uh, human-computer interaction. Mm -hmm. We had about uh, machine learning operation, and we had uh, talk about uh, uh, advanced analytics and mm -hmm. uh, game theory. Then we had uh, six talks, sh light lightning talks uh, from uh, women in the field uh, that mm -hmm. they had five minutes explaining about how infrastructure uh, in the problem in their domain works from different companies. And uh, we also had uh, a, a mingle, a virtual mm -hmm. mingle. A virtual mingle, how does yes. that work? How did that work? <laughs> <laughs> so uh, we, um, so last week I attended the Rexis conference yeah. where they used uh, a new platform, gather.town. Mm -hmm. uh, gather.town? Yeah. Uh, and uh, it's a, uh, 2D pixeled environment and you have a virtual uh -huh. avatar and then uh, you can uh, you can build a, a conference rooms, you can build a bar and you can have a lot of like virtual elements that to interact with and uh, it's, it's super nice because you have um, audio and video and then uh, if you move from people uh, away uh, uh -huh. their video is fading and their audio uh -huh. fading if you are close uh, you, and you can locate people and move to them. And then there are designated areas so that no one else can hear you. So people are sitting behind web cameras and you can see yeah, so the one close to you in this, in this virtual So space like you somehow. just, you just, uh, you just connect. So like as an organizer, we, def we built like one environment and then mm -hmm. you just join that environment with your, um, okay. microphone and, and, and your, your camera on. And, uh, then, uh, if you can move with arrow keys and if you are like your avatars are close to each other so oh. you can you can talk to each other and hear each other and see each, and other, see each as well. other as well uh cool. yeah so it was it was a very interesting experiment and i think uh, people had some fun mm -hmm. yeah so it was positive or i mean obviously it's a lot of differences from a physical conference but yeah. what were your expectations and how did it actually turn out you'd say so I think in the past six months, I attended a few conferences. So like few days conferences, um, uh, like more scientific ones, or like, you know, one day conferences or meetups. And uh, many of them, they are not engaging. Many of them, they require you as a speaker to record yourself. And then like you have, for instance, like just the Q&A that is interactive or... 
Uh, even the Q&A sometimes is just like a text mm. and um, the mingle is not really interactive. But um, I think this one probably was the best that I've seen. Um, but also like, you know, I should not talk about our own <laughs> event and say it was like the best, but I think it was a good platform to try out. It's quite new. I don't know how they, they scale, but, uh, we enjoyed the experiment. Maybe that's the point when we do something virtual like this, it has yeah. to be some fun to it or something to yeah. break the ice. Yeah. Um, what do you think, uh, going into a virtual event, uh, my experience has been also that we know it's also up to who is participating to transfer the conference behavior onto a virtual platform. So it's, it's actually a lot of responsibility yeah. on how you use the platform. I, I've seen quite a few conferences having quite good service, yeah. but we're not really using it as, as mm -hmm. participants. Yeah, I agree. I mean, the, the other good conference that I attended, uh, was, um, uh, foundation of games. And like, you know, in that domain, people in general uh, are very interactive. They like to have conversations. It's a, it's a smaller community, but it's a very fun community to, to work with. And then you could see like it was with Discord and uh, it was Zoom, but you could see people how much they are engaged. They give comment, they like uh, share things with each other. But while like, you know, you go to another conference, it's like the style is very formal and uh, uh, everyone is busy, so they zone in to the conference and zone out, uh, and they are not as engaged. So, 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 and uh, and it could be Zoom or whatever technology yeah. is used in both of them, but the experience becomes quite different yeah, based exactly. on what the community does with it. Yeah. So I've attended two conferences, both of them using Hova and Zoom, Zoom. So similar mm. setup. But one of them was very interactive, and the other one wasn't at all. Yeah. Do you think as a, as a conference producer, because now you've been on this side, yeah. uh, what are the small tricks and tips that you can do using the same technology, but essentially promote, you know, uh, getting the movement, getting the interaction mm -hmm. happening? Can you, what is, what's your best trick? I think, uh, we need to iterate quite a lot to <laughs> succeed. <Yeah. laughs> so we haven't reached there yet, but, uh, what we did though, I have to say that we, we did a test run. So we had mm -hmm. a meetup during summer. So that we learn, mm. uh, we learned quite a lot from that. Uh, and then we, 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 we planned this event according to that one. So like the interaction piece was missing and we learned that it should be there. One of the thing that, uh, I've also learned to like secondhand information is that like, there is also a risk of, uh, people bullying each other in the chats. Uh, so like it's. Uh, we went, we decided to go for a webinar format because, um, we wanted to, like, sometimes, you know, that it's a small community, you know, who is joining, then it's like, mm, you feel more comfortable to take the risk of like having an open, uh, platform. Uh, but sometimes it's not possible. And in this case, we decided to go for a webinar. Um, but then, uh, like our speakers had some, uh, engagement elements. Um, and we always also have a poll in our events so that like, it's, like participants can, can tell about themselves, uh, give us some input. I think one thing that is super important is also to communicate, uh, like send out, uh, to, uh, participants, like, here's how you can, uh, dial in here are like the platform that we are going to Giving use. Giving instructions, even Giving, how to yeah, behave. Exactly. So instructions is, is, is super key. Is super, yeah. And then, um, yeah, during the event, I think again, like each of each, each, each of the, uh, speakers, if they have some element of interaction, uh, asking a question and see what people write, for instance, in the chat, That's uh, nice. that gives you at least some, some point of I'm and there. They there, there are me. small means to have some different types of, uh, questions and what do you call it when you have some sort of mentometer? Yeah. Uh, you have something to voting, system. voting systems. There are quite so small things like this. The experience changes quite a bit, I guess. Yeah. I mean, it's still, I think it's a learning experience for everyone. So I would say it takes like a year mm -hmm. that like to have this attempt at least once, and then you know what you do better next mm -hmm. time. And a lot of companies are starting building new things that mm -hmm. you, new platforms that we can use. Mm -hmm. Speaking about the future. What do you think about, you know, women and data science one year from now or when the Corona pandemic starting to pan out a bit and 
starting to return a bit to normal. Do you think it will go back basically to the old style or traditional style of conferences? I or? think we are missing this touch of like having a like person to person interaction. Yeah. So we would love to go back to a normal situation. Mm. Uh, but like, I think at this point it's very unclear because this next event is going to be in March. Mm. Um, but do you think like uh, three years ahead, uh, assume we have vaccines for everything and we have the, the pandemic under control? So there is there is a couple of things. Uh, I think having, again, so I, I really like to have this local interaction so people mm. can meet. Like I'm looking for a mentor, so I want to like, mm. you know, meet this person. It's just like you get like, you know, uh, uh you, you you share emotions, you figure out like the pain of people, you figure mm. out like, you know, oh, that I can like, you know, have more coffee with this person and like learn more. So that I really miss and, and I, w- I would like to have that uh, and continue having that. But the other aspect is that uh, opportunities. Mm. So mm. I think in my opinion, having everything centralized in Stockholm is not fair. Like, you know, uh, if you have someone super interested uh, that can't attend to a, like a, to like fly from Lulio uh, for a one day conference, mm. why not being able to join virtually? Yeah. So maybe a mix of the two mm. uh, would be a good thing uh, to have. Mm. Uh, I mean, I, I'm, I'm complaining about conferences that I attended, but mm. like a lot of these conferences I couldn't have attend mm. if it wasn't virtual, right? Mm-hmm. So, so we are maybe so going to something as a hybrid or of yeah, some kind. I, I, I'm, I'm hoping for that. I, I like a hybrid. Yeah, I mean, it could be a way because conference can also be something that only the, like a very few top people can go to. Mm-hmm. And perhaps by having a more easy to access type of conference, more people can simply enjoy yeah. and learn more. Yeah, and this, right? there is another dimension and it's the cost mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. so like the, this or producing or attending or attending or attending yeah. well i mean it's both but i think i would say attending mm-hmm. so like uh, we have conferences that their cost is like a thousand dollar yeah and uh, i mean if you if you are coming from a startup for instance like you you can't really attend those conferences mm-hmm. even for the sake of experience so um mm-hmm. i would argue for that uh that would reduce the cost. But so, yeah, yeah I, I just want to, because you asked about women in data science mm. uh, and like what I see in a year. Um, I mean, I forgot to say that like, you know, we have the conference that we are organizing with my super awesome co-organizers. Mm. Um, we also, so we are, we have this group, Women in Data Science Sweden group, mm. which we are quite active uh, in Facebook. That's, that's a Facebook group, right? But so. we also have like some a LinkedIn group and we have a mm. Twitter uh, account. Um, we do some other initiatives. So we are trying to like, you know, grow the community. So mm. uh, we have been running some uh, meetups. Uh, we have been also like planning uh, to have uh, a mentorship program. Mm. Uh, and like a book reading club uh, and like a few of these initiatives. So hopefully that we can support uh, women in the field to uh, mm-hmm. uh, to grow further. And, and what uh, made you passionate about driving this community or be part of this community? What's important for you? So for this? this started with, uh, I think it was, so I was attending women in tech conference and then uh, I met Galina, one of my co-organizers there, and uh, we started talking together as like, we feel that we don't have our own community community because we were coming f- from like a technical background and like data and AI. And uh, we felt like s- there is a gap and we don't find women in the field that much in, in Sweden. And uh, she attended the uh, Women in Data Science in, in London. And then she told me, hey, listen, there is such a thing, like, you know, should we try that? And we said, like, let's just start it. And then uh, Rebecca joined, we started the first year, and then uh, Tonya and Karin joined us. So do you have a mission statement for the Stockholm <laughs> chapter? Uh, yeah, so our mission is to, uh, okay, I, 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 I don't remember exactly, but like, you know, as, as I was saying, like, it's around, uh, we want to inspire and grow this community. Uh, so that's the that's the uh, most important goal we have. So lots of interesting topics here, like uh, you know how to attract talents. And, yeah, and, we can know, we will come back to we will circle and, back uh, to several of these topics. But yeah. maybe 
yeah, should so uh, exactly. introduce uh, Sahar properly. Who would you like to tell me us uh, who who is Sahar? Uh, how far back should I go? <laughs> oh, up to you. Uh, maybe I can start from from who I am now. Uh, so I am uh, AI research lead at King. Uh, I joined King a year and a half ago, and uh, uh, so I've been. Uh, and if there are a few people that don't know what King is, can you just like so we can give a yeah. larger introduction later, but just a very brief one. What, so, what is really King? Uh, King uh, is a gaming company uh, focused on uh, casual games, especially in mobile domain. Mm. Um, many people know uh, King uh, for Candy Crush, yes. uh, yes. but there are also a lot of other games, mm. uh, and we keep continuing uh, uh, working on new games. Mm. Um, so you joined King in 2000, was it 19. 19. Yeah. yeah. Uh, and uh, yeah, so uh, King is a Swedish company, mm. and uh, um, we like the the main Candy franchises are also like uh, Candy Crush Saga uh, mm. and Candy Crush Soda are based in Stockholm, so are the teams that I'm uh, mostly interacting with, mm. and uh, yeah, and the. Uh, King was acquired by Activision Blizzard uh, a few years ago. Mm -hmm. So we are a part of Act King, uh, Activision Blizzard King. Mm -hmm. So before we go more into, you know, what King is doing and how AI works and yeah. how they use data and everything, just perhaps a bit more, you know, what did you do before King as well? Um, okay, here's what, what I asked, like, you know, how back I should go. Uh, mm -hmm. So I've studied computer science. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm originally from Iran. Yeah. Uh, I did my bachelor and master in Iran in computer science. Uh, moved from for my PhD to Sweden. Did my uh, PhD in uh, applied autonomous sensor system lab in Örebro. Mm -hmm. um, in the past eight years, eight years and a half, I've been working in industry. So I first uh, back in 2012 started working in a startup. Um, uh, Oculus AI, uh, working on um, computer vision and information retrieval. And then uh, the company got acquired uh, uh, in 2013 uh, by Meltwater. And uh, I joined Meltwater. So we started the um, tech office uh, in Stockholm. Um, it was only sale and marketing back then in Stockholm. And uh, there I worked for three years on uh, natural language processing and uh, information retrieval. I organized the uh, Stockholm NLP meetups uh, back then. Uh, then uh, I felt like I would like to work with machine learning that is uh, reaching to consumer. Mm -hmm. uh, so um, I uh, joined the Spotify where mm -hmm. we met. Yeah. I worked at the Spotify for two years and a half as a data scientist. And uh, after that, I left for a startup, uh, Cluster One, uh, American company, and uh, which I was working remote, by the way. So mm -hmm. I was used to working <laughs> remote from no, there. We didn't have a Stockholm office at no, the time? No, no, I was the only one from Stockholm. Mm -hmm. uh, and then uh, uh, I was there for eight months and uh, we decided not to continue with the company and I moved to uh, King. Cool. And what does Cluster One do, very briefly? I mean, it, the company doesn't exist at the moment, yeah. uh, but. Uh, Did, though. Well, we were building uh, a distributed uh, deep learning uh, platform. Mm. Uh, so we had two, two parts. Uh, one was like building the platform and infrastructure. Uh, as a service, and the other part was also like a research and consulti consulting uh, mm -hmm. as a researcher uh, to companies. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, so um, we we were working from like uh, with different companies from uh, different domains, mm -hmm. and uh, the goal was to build an end-to-end -end, uh, system that you don't have to go with like you know as a as a machine learning researcher you mm -hmm. don't have to go to a lot of engineering details if you mm -hmm. want to test out and iterate about your model and just for all the techie pe people listening to this you know uh, how do you do distributed machine learning training uh okay uh so um, when, when we say distributed you have you can think about distributed in different ways one is that let's say you want to run um 
you run an experiment and you want to have five trials. So you can distribute those five trials, mm -hmm. right? Um, that was like, you know, a usual thing that like in the past was happening with the tech, right? Then you can distribute a model, you can distribute data. Mm -hmm. Distributing model means that like you have a huge network, let's say you want to put in a, a CPU and mm -hmm. like it doesn't fit. So you distribute the infrastructure, different layers are in different. You uh, split the model in different parts. Yeah, right? exactly. Um, then you have distributed data, which is where, what um, our focus was on, uh, where the idea is that you can, um, you, you can batch your data in different ways uh, to fit it, fit it to uh, your model. And uh, you also need a different, like you also need a strategy to aggregate those information. Um, and yeah, this was, this is more or less where we were focusing on distributed deep learning. Mm -hmm. And that was with TensorFlow or PyTorch or whatever? Um, or so we were supporting a lot of different uh, uh, libraries and packages. Uh, so we, we were focused on TensorFlow, but we were using uh, PyTorch, Keras. So back then, mm. TensorFlow and uh, Keras had more differences. Mm. Uh, uh, Cafe, uh, Chain. Um, I'm missing one, but one more. So g given today's situation with all the libraries, if someone wants to do distributed training, let's say model parallel, no, let's say in the normal data parallel thing, mm -hmm. that, what would you recommend them to use? What do you think works the best today? Oh, <laughs> you're asking tricky questions. Uh, I think first of all, you need to see if you really need the distributed <laughs> training because uh, but I King think- But King, I guess, does quite often, right? Yeah, um, or? yes. Uh, I mean, when we get to research, yes, but not necessarily in, in production, you don't really need the, we don't have like a super complex model that requires, or we have enough resources that you don't need to do like, um, distributed deep learning, but for very, most of the research that we do, we, we need that. Mm -hmm. So I think the common go-to is now GPU, mm -hmm. uh, and TensorFlow has good packages, uh, to just try out and do distributed, uh, training. Mm. I Just think too, is it that easy really? I think okay, so that's what I wanted to say <laughs> uh, next. It's like but the devil is in the details. Yeah. Uh so the thing is that at least in my experience, uh, for instance, we worked with a company that uh, they were benchmarking our platform and they said that well, I'm using only one uh, core mm. and everything works better than when I'm using uh, multiple cores. Mm. And we had to do a lot of research and like figuring out like, you know, why. And what we learned is that like, you know, the, the setup that they have, first of all, like you need to spend a lot of time of like about the nature of the problem you are trying to solve, solve nature of your data, the model that you, 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 you are going to use. And then the other thing was that, um, so for instance, like the batch size is mm. an important factor when you want to uh, have a, a distributed deep learning mm. and that was not set properly oh, okay. and a few other things. So like you, it's not uh, devil is in the detail. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, trying it out is mm. easy. Yeah. I would say, uh, there's, and it's tons of, uh, libraries and in, in like, you know, YouTube videos to just look and try out. Mm. But um, getting it right for like a production work, mm. I would say it's, uh, yeah, mm. we get to the details. So it sounds like Sahor is a very techie person as well <laughs> and a data science expert, right? And uh, before we, we move on, you have some other passions, right? Uh, data, women in data science, I guess, is, is one. Yeah. Any other like passions that uh, people don't know about you? Uh, techie or non-techie? Non-techie is fine. Both. Yeah. Both. <laughs> I think... Uh, yeah, I, I used to, I mean, I injured myself, uh, so I'm not playing as much, but I used to play volleyball quite a lot. Mm -hmm. Uh, I still do. So we have a ball in our car that's every time, <laughs> yeah, a volleyball ball that we just, really yeah, yeah. So if we go somewhere that we can uh, try, so I mm -hmm. play volleyball a bit. Mm -hmm. That's my passion outside. Um, if I get time, um, I used to do some calligraphy, mm -hmm. um, I mean, of course, also like reading some books, watching mm. some series. Uh, you asked about techie things. I think I like to learn new things. Yeah. Mm. Uh, so I keep just like, you know, exploring and trying out new things. I also have a passion for physics. 
Mm-hmm. Uh, Interesting. I, I was I was going for physics before starting computer science, but yeah. it's just like a dice of. Uh, why did we, uh, why we went left or right? Uh, yeah, it's a dice. Uh, well, I mean, I I attended a, a national nationwide entrance exam uh, back then. It was like quite intense thing in Iran. And I just wanted to re- study physics in one particular university, and I I think like my I was in borderline for 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 that uh, university, mm-hmm. and then I was like, okay, I want to do physics, but I also like complex systems, and I like simulation in physics. So and I like analytics thinking and like algorithms. So then I learned about computer science and moved to computer science. And a specific part of physics, physics otherwise, that you were so extra interested in? I was doing a lot of experimental physics mm-hmm. and when I was in high school. So I was attending like student conferences. Uh, and uh, so I, I, I like to understand the phenomenon. Mm-hmm. Uh, and uh, yeah, so experimental physics a bit of neuroscience, mm. uh, neuroscience, which is like between physics and computer yes. and math. So, yeah. I was always hoping you're going to say quantum mechanics as well. <laughs> well, for now. well, yeah, <laughs> <laughs> that was a long time ago. So mm. quantum mechanics, maybe now. Mm. Maybe. <laughs> but uh, we, we skipped over your PhD perhaps a bit too quickly as well. If you were to describe it still, how would you describe the focus uh, that you had in your PhD? Yeah, I think uh, I was just saying like my PhD probably was not like uh, the normal, usual way of doing PhD. Um, So my PhD topic was on uh, mobile robot olfaction. Uh, So um, the full name is like a gas statistical gas distribution modeling and sensor planning. Mm. But if I want to explain it simple, this was part of uh, an EU project uh, where like a few universities and companies working together on uh, gas distribution modelings and like decision making ma- making platforms for for in case of like incidents mm. uh, that gas in- is involved. Um, there I was yeah, applying machine learning uh, to estimate gas distribution where the environment is dynamic. So you have like wind, for instance, mm. um, when and you have like a sparse measurements uh, of, of gas and then also planning where to acquire the ne- next sample, which is the most informative uh, one. Mm-hmm. Uh, given like the target that you have, for instance, if you want to know the source or if you want to know. Uh, the concentration, you might have a different strategy. So mm. you do a so multi-objective connect- optimization. Yeah, and connected perhaps to active learning or finding the next point too. Yeah, I think I back then I didn't think of, like I didn't know mm. the name of active learning, mm. but I think it's, yeah, it's connected. Um, mm. But uh, talking about uh, my uh, uh, journey of PhD. Mm-hmm. Yeah, please. Uh, so I started in 2009. Uh, doing my PhD and uh, in so my funding was a three years funding mm. so back then PhD in Sweden was three years planned mm. uh, well, for have, a period yeah license you mean for no no uh, for a period uh, okay. so uh, in in UK in Netherlands <laughs> in France France still does that mm. so it was an EU thing a lot of uh, okay. fundings were planned for three years yeah but the normal Swedish one is not right so, so Back then in Orebro was three years. In, for instance, KTH was four years. Yeah. Uh, in, in like, I think around 2012 or 13, this changed. So now it's like four years and then you have 20% of teaching. So back mm-hmm. then was t- three years and 20 years, uh, 20% of teaching. Sounds a bit strange to me, but okay. I'll, yeah, I'll but, leave it uh, that, but they, uh, yeah. So you had your courses yeah. uh, from your master mm-hmm. uh, that was counted. So you didn't take ah, the one year include, of te- oh, yeah, I yeah. see. You can include some of the master work. That yeah, yeah okay. exactly. Oh, yeah. So um, my funding was finished after two years and mm-hmm. I was like, okay, I don't think like I, what I have is enough. You, you are never satisfied with what you have, no. right? So, and then I was like, okay, maybe I need to start working mm-hmm. and while working, I will finish my PhD. Mm-hmm. And uh, then I started working and then like you have this like ramping up times of like working and then you get to know your work and uh, new things. Then moved to the next company and uh, and I was never happy with like, you know, this is, I feel like I need to do more and more. Mm. So it took me, a, uh, I think, a couple of years to get in peace with myself that, listen, this is enough. 
Mm. And it was maybe because like, you know, also uh, a paper that we submitted during what, so I was doing like my work and I was also mm. writing my yeah. papers and so on. So like I got very good positive feedbacks on the paper. I was like, oh, this is really mm. enough. So, uh, and I finished 2017. So, and um, yeah, so it was not a smooth uh, journey. <laughs> But the last year is interesting time, so because that's, uh, normal, it, it, it shows also there are different ways of doing it. Yeah, PhD. exactly. That you don't, yeah. you know, straight straight off uh, out of school in in parallel when you're working. Yeah. yeah. So I think all ways are good. Yeah. But you have some really popular papers as well. Uh, I think one of the top one is this also Kavosh paper. Or is yeah, that's from my master's studies. Ah, okay. So I've done. I think. My journey in computer science has been mm. quite like, you know, going different applications. So oh. in my bachelor, I was doing distributed uh, AI. Mm. My master, I worked on computational biology. Mm. And uh, the paper Kavosh is uh, about um, a work that we did on uh, pattern finding. So it's like... Mm. Um, so you have protein protein interaction networks so you can define how net, uh, how proteins interact with each other mm. uh in in like in a living body uh as a network mm. and it's basically the graph right mm. so then um you can have uh you if the idea is that there are subgraphs uh or like we call it motif that are responsible for certain uh functions Mm-hmm. And uh, this pattern consists if you, you go from like one living body to another one. So, oh, so it's a network of proteins. How, yeah, exactly. How they are connected to each other. Yeah, how they interact with each other. Yeah. So you have this graph of network of proteins and the goal was to find find an efficient way that you can find the subgraphs or motifs. Mm-hmm. Uh, and the thing is that... And what is a motif, by the way? So I'm motif sorry. is... A subgraph of the graph, so mm. and uh, that means that you have a set of proteins um, that they, you know that they interact with each other. For instance, if I know in yeast mm. um, that is a simple, uh, small network compared to like human uh, uh, protein network, mm. if I know this particular part of interactions of protein is responsible for uh, a certain uh behavior or mm. sometimes it might be a dysfunction uh in uh in the cell or like in 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 this species then if i remember correctly you know this is like a very long time ago so i don't know how much the field has changed but the idea was that um this subgraph is mm. also uh you can find similar thing in let's say a human and it's responsible for the same thing mm. so that we wanted to find those so quickly find similar structures. Yeah, exactly. Mm-hmm. And then um, back then, so we had a low computation fi- uh, power. So it's interesting if you read the paper, you see, mm-hmm. I, it's, I was just looking a few weeks ago that mm-hmm. you see we describe the uh, memory used mm-hmm. and like the CPU used mm-hmm. and like, you know, how much of the subgraphs we could detect mm-hmm. uh, with, in what size. And you see there is a cap that we couldn't go more than that. Uh, it's like 12, I think, or something. Mm. And if you look at the numbers, it's like, this is nothing. I can just run it on my computer now. <laughs> really? Yeah. But I would like to move further now. Mm-hmm. And I would like to explore a little bit, what does it mean to be lead AI researcher at King? And there are many angles we can explore here, but let, w- what is AI at King and what is the lead mm-hmm. AI re- researcher do at King? So um, my team is uh, named AI R&D. So we are an R&D team uh, within um, the to- tech organization uh, at King. Uh, and then we have a lot of games, right? So um, the tech organization uh, is responsible for supporting each of these uh, games, like a startup that you have, mm-hmm. right? Um, then um, what, our, what our team is focused on is in three areas. So we work on uh, uh, content generation. We are, um, so like for instance, content uh, level in Candy Crush is a content or right. like, you know, you can have like a lot of like, av- um, a lot of different assets that we have in, in different games are, are, are our content. So content generation. Then we have also like user understanding and recommender systems another area, and then building tools and infrastructure to scale machine learning in the company. 
the thing is that like a lot of uh, if you look at um, the well-established AI companies, most of them, um, they are, um, so they have been built with a lot of like, you know, there's a lot of wind that you can have with like uh, innovation and then like you get to a point that you need to scale and then like you start like looking at like, I want to apply AI. And so uh, it's, it's like, you know, it's different from compared to Spotify. Uh, for instance, Spotify uh, has recommender system as it's, as part of its core, right? Uh, but uh, in, hard, in, hard to add afterwards, maybe. Yeah, I would say so. But like in, in, in uh, there's so many elements in gaming that like you can, you can start working and building a successful game uh, before in, in bringing in AI. So one of our goal is to like, you know, uh, scale AI in the company. So companies... We have been uh, actually, I think, like three years ago, for instance, we built a bot uh, that helps with uh, playtesting uh, levels uh, in, in Candy Crush to, so that it tells you before releasing this level, uh, tells you how difficult this level is. So like you don't want to have like, you know, uh, when you have the sequence of the levels that are uh, in, in Candy Crush uh, saga progression map. You don't want to have like all continuously easy levels or continuously difficult levels because either you get uh, bored or you get frustrated, right? So you want to have a good user experience. And we use this bot to uh, give us an estimate of the difficulty of the level before giving it to the user. So that's one piece, like, you know, set building AI for development. Um, we do research for long-term things. So like it's quite exploratory research, for instance, on reinforcement learning to just um, assess like the potential uh, for future of, at the company. And then we also spend a lot of time on build, bringing research to these examples of uh, use cases that I mentioned in product. So how would you, how, how would this sort of the promise of AI or the value proposition of AI for King, how would that be sort of on, how would you describe that on a business level so to our people vision, who, are not, who are not AI people? So our vision, I would say, is to enable uh, game development. Uh, and uh, so it's like building tools that enables a better game development. And uh, the other piece is to improve user experience. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, we believe gaming is like a creative work. Mm. And... Uh, so this is similar, like Spotify want to, for one, have a great user experience yeah, exactly. listening to music, but they also want to help artists. Exactly. So you want to do the same, but then have a good user experience and also developers of games to have a good experience. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Ah, cool. And I'm thinking more, I mean, for a company like King, of course, analytics is very important and being mm -hmm. able to understand users mm -hmm. and, you know, do traditional things like user retention uh, prediction and things like that. And, and then AI sometimes can be described differently. Different people, you know, uh, describe this in different ways. But some people at least there's, say there's a difference between, you know, what AI should mean and perhaps what analytics or advanced analytics should be. What's your view of that? Do you have any differences in what, like, analytics and AI mean? Uh, that's one of the difficult questions. <laughs> Sorry for that. Uh, may I, may I rephrase it a little bit? Okay. Because one of the conversations we've had which is more, maybe more, I, I, I refer to our discussion with Cole to me at Epidemic Sound. We, you know, he was very clear. I'm a machine learning engineer. I'm not a data scientist. And he, he, he even when he presented himself, he sort of positioned himself. I'm not the statist advanced analytics person and I'm not a software engineer, you know. So I think that's kind of, that's been one of the moments we have come with several guests that you can start machine learning engineering without doing analytics and vice versa. So, so here is a very interesting topic of misconception, yeah. probably in, in, one, in some organization or in more traditional organizations. I think, um, so if I want to structure my, my, uh, my answer is like in, I have like answers in few dimensions. Mm -hmm. So one is that just looking at like my journey, I started as like research scientist, again, research scientist, mm -hmm computer scientist, research scientist, data scientist, product data scientist. Um, well, my first title at the spot, if I was advanced analytics analyst, <laughs> uh, which was a strange uh, title, mm. but for a product data scientist, 
uh, machine learning engineer and now AI research lead. So you see, like, you know, I've, yeah. I've been going through a lot of different top <laughs> titles. But, but can you distinctly see the difference in what you did when you were more on the scientist side yeah. or the ML engineer side? As yeah, an yes, yes, and no. And that's where I want to reach things. Like if, whenever I meet a person and they like, they say any of these um, titles, okay. yeah. even, and also if you include also data engineering, I ask um, what exactly do you do? So yes, that I exactly. get a sense of like this title in this particular company, what yes. it means. I think um, a lot of companies are moving towards like if you want to think of machine learning to have machine learning engineer title um, because it's it's easier to hire mm. because people are used to this 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 title this year. Maybe not like next year. That's something the, that, would this be is the different. new cool uh, title. I think ML Ops is also a ML cool Ops. Company. We we have been ML Ops, ML Engineering. That's yeah. 2020. Yeah, yeah. Not 18. Not 18. Yeah, exactly. And uh, I guess we we can agree that you know a lot of companies are abusing the terms. You know yeah. what yeah. an analyst does and and should do, yeah. and what AI is and should do, and what a data scientist is and so forth. Mm -hmm. But but if we take like King and and you mentioned a number of examples like content generation or recommender systems or you know, understanding users potentially. And you can think about analytics, you know, which is super important to understand, you know, how the KPIs are moving and, you know, having a good visualization of those, etc. cetera. Um, oh, this is a difficult question, but what would you say is the more proper term when to say I'm actually working with AI or not? If we ignore the title of the role, mm -hmm. so to speak, mm -hmm. for now. So um, my team is working on AI, right? So mm -hmm. like we also have data scientists and like yeah, also we have business analysts in, mm -hmm. in the company. Um, I think... So a lot of... Okay, it's um, I'm trying to formulate it. <laughs> um, I would say... Um, so a lot of things that it goes, for instance, on the time that you spend on um, focusing on uh, KPIs mm. uh, or like you look at uh, A-B tests that you're mm. running, those are a lot of analytics work yeah. that uh, you need a lot of good, you might need a lot of good statistics knowledge, you might need a lot of uh, um, a bit of data engineering work, a bit of data visualization work that it goes there. But I consider those more of like under analytics part yeah. of mm. data science. Yes, I agree. Uh, but then um, we also have like, by the way, like we have also like, for instance, st statisticians mm. that spend on research concepts to bring into improving, like for instance, how you interpret an A-B test better, mm. right? So I, that that I call it data advanced statistics mm -hmm. part. Um, having said that, I think data scientists uh, work is also uh, about building predictive models, not just like, you know, mm, doing a data exploration. Looking at AI, I think 80% of the work is actually data science work, data mm -hmm. exploration work and understanding your m metrics and like, uh, and so on. And then 20% of that is like building a model. Mm -hmm. When it is super applied, I would call that maybe applied AI or applied ML mm -hmm. uh, or applied or engineering ML. Mm -hmm. When it comes, because you want to bring that to a pro production. So you want to deploy, in the end, you want to find the right model to deploy it in a, as part of the yeah. product or user experience for the customer yeah, and or you, for the developer. Exactly. And you need to think about a lot of things. If like, you know, we, we had just a discussion about like mm. distributed uh, deep learning, for instance, you need some knowledge around like how you orchestrate things yeah. around that too, right? But there is also a, a piece um, that you need to spend a lot of time on finding out what is actually a right um, model. Why can't I, I, like, you know, if I am doing a normal clustering, mm. why every time it returns a different answer, right? Mm. So how, how can I uh, improve that? Or like, you know, if I'm building a predictive model, um, how can consider like certain factors or how can I model like similar to the work that we did before mm. together back yeah. in Spotify, you want to like have uh, uh, a better understanding of your user journey. You set out a whole research agenda that is unclear scope mm. and you need to figure out that the scope and to establish like machine learning foundations there. I would say 
it requires a lot of data science and engineering work as well, but the, the weight of research is higher. And then I call that like uh, ML research uh -huh. work. Mm -hmm. yeah, right. yeah. And ML perhaps is a more clear term. AI is so hard or you know, abused so many times. Yeah, so it's sometimes exactly. a bit hard and, to understand. And, and when we met, I asked you, so what do you do as a ML researcher on a daily basis? <laughs> so what does that mean? <laughs> well, I attend meetings, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, prepare slides. Yeah. But you had, uh, some you had some core, in the end, we came up with a couple of core dimensions yes, of the role. Yeah, so yeah. As, as a research lead, I, um, I spend a lot of time on thinking about and like planning, bringing research to production. Mm. Uh, so thinking about how can we have how can we package our research and scope it in a way that can has positive impact on, on a product? Mm. Um, in this case, our games, for instance. Uh, and then the other part is about uh, uh, mentorship and supervision uh, yeah, so of interns and master students and industrial PhDs. Yes. You mentioned that you some way had some sort of passion for taking research into product. Yes. Could you please elaborate on that? Um, so I think, it, you know, it, especially now, I think this is a trend that I really hope that would be a focus in ML communities in the next couple of years, at least, because there's a lot of resources out there that you can just like, you know, existing models. Yeah. There is a lot of like people. Fresh. Libraries, frameworks. <laughs> exactly. And Go nuts. And then uh, fresh graduates from school that they, maybe their knowledge is sometimes might be like, you know, most, more up to date than a lot of people that they are in industry, in this field, right? Um, but you sometimes miss these key questions of like, what am I this, uh, what am I uh, building this for? Like, uh, am I optimizing? So if, if I build a super complex model and then I put it in production and, uh, by the way, this metric that this data that you trained your model for with, uh, in the streaming data that doesn't exist or like they are very different and uh, measured differently with a different so, uh, frequency. So a theoretical research concept doesn't really fly when you really want yeah, to put it in production. Yeah, or you want to have like high, you, you, like it's a matter of latency, for instance. Mm. And then the other thing is that you optimize for precision and recall accuracy, and then you put that in production and like the metric that you need to satisfy is like user engagement. But how do you map, uh, like when you are training, t try out tons of different models, um, how do you map the metrics that you uh, have looked metrics. at to the metric that you want to optimize in production? Mm -hmm. And then the other part is that very often product people have an idea of what they want to build. Still, there is a, a lot of iterations that you need to make to translate that to what, what data, what metrics, mm -hmm. what model, what problem then you can start looking at things. And I think that's a challenge that uh, uh, I, I, I like us to, to do. And I spend a lot of time and I'm passionate about, especially around metrics. But, but I, I think uh, even going back to, uh, I work with uh, Vattenfall for several years. Mm -hmm. And I remember uh, like a war story that, uh, you know, the uh, head of uh, strategy, one of, in the export uh, members, you know, he wanted to talk to me at some kind. And so, and so I, he, he gave me a sort of five minutes. Okay. What's the problem? What, why, why can't we move faster? And, you know, thinking on the spot like this. Mm -hmm. And I basically blurped out, you know, from nowhere, uh, I think it's the uh, business to data and analytics translation, which is the whole problem, uh, for us to get started. I mean, like the business people in their domain has no, so little knowledge yeah. around what this can be done. So how we translate this into the problem that is solvable with data and AI is number one. Yeah. And the more I think about this and the more experienced I have become, I, I see this more and more. And this, I, I think you are now pushing this even further that this is really tricky. Yeah? If you really want to do AI in production, because if you really do it all the way down, you know, feature engineering, metric setting, et cetera, et cetera, it's huge. Yeah. It's really tricky. I think it comes from different sides as well. It's like, you know, it's like it's very often you have engineering team building something for you 
And then I'm like, well, I want to put my model in production and this engineering infrastructure that you mm. are giving me has zero flexibility for that. So you need an interaction with engineers. Then you also have the product of like, you know, really what's, what's sometimes they come and say, I want to have prediction of X and, or can you improve X? And then you'd need to dig in what actually they mean it might be like, you can do something much simpler. Mm. Um, and very often people don't think about the maintenance cost of machine learning models. And um, you need to think of like, you know, uh, how much maintenance I bring into this team that doesn't have enough knowledge of uh, maintaining a machine learning model and how much explainability do they need to feel comfortable uh, using that model. I remember in, in Spotify, I worked on a project um, that we wanted to shorten the time that we run an A-B test on, on uh, new users. And uh, um, we, we were discussing of like, can we, instead of like looking for a longer term, look at shorter term and, and predict that. We started looking at very complex, I, I personally started looking at complex uh, models to start with. Mm. And then uh, you start talking with product owners and you realize that, oh, what they actually want is that if I'm going to use this, I need to know if I turn this knob, how much the other thing changes. So they feel comfortable with using this as a decision-making tool. Mm. And then we, we ended up using making a much simpler <laughs> model uh, with Usability my colleague. was more important than anything else, maybe. Uh, explainability. Or explainability, yeah, understandability exactly. for the user. Exactly. I mean, I remember this very well as well yeah. uh, from that time. And it's kind of funny. Sometimes you can think about that project as either a very you know, high successful outcome yeah. or actually a failure in some sense because we didn't need the ML model yeah. to start with. Yeah. But I, I would say, and let me know what you think about this, but I think it's a very, you know, the best outcome you can almost think about for a machine learning project because we, we had a number of features or you know, input signals that we could measure. We didn't know really what affected the target that we had, yeah. but we needed to model that somehow, used machine learning, could uh, get some kind of feature importance for that. And so, yeah. you know, oh, one of them is super strong. Why don't we just remove the rest and just use this one yeah, as exactly. a single metric? Yeah. And then we didn't need to train a model. We can easily put it in production and we can understand it very, very easily. Yeah. But still, you know, without having taken the step exactly. to go through that and, and measure that with machine learning, we wouldn't have known that in a scientific yeah. sense, right? Uh, I, I totally agree. This is where you need, like, this is the part I said, like, you need an ML research mm -hmm. where you know how to structure the problem. You look at it, you build a model, you look at the feature importance, you do look at like a lot of impact importance factors. Mm. And then, but you also need like this mentality of like at the end, where am I putting this? So you have the applied ML hat. Mm. And then what do I really need? Yeah, exactly. Bottom line, what do I and, really need to solve this? Yeah, at the end, I agree. It was like in a sense, like, you know, being so excited as a researcher <laughs> is a failure, but yeah. like also I think from a business perspective, it's beautiful. It gets out and they are using it, then mm. I feel also like very excited. Mm. <laughs> but just continuing a bit about new maintenance of ML and, and people, you know, so many people I think in AI only build prototypes and it never reached production or some product or some use or value for the company in some way. Mm -hmm. And uh, I mean, you have done that a number of times. Well, um, have you seen this as well? That, you know, so many people think, you know, just having trained a model and, and seen the, you know, that some accuracy score is enough. And, and then, you know, what's left really, you would say, to actually have that integrated in some product or, or some system? I think, yeah. Um there is a one factor that is like a much larger, if you can, if you prefer, we can talk about it later. And that's the human factor. Mm -hmm. It's like if your decision maker is on board to support you and fund your project yeah. and also sponsoring, something. Yeah, sponsoring the, the project mm -hmm. and also have the openness of trying machine learning and understand that uh, you can't have uh, a normal uh like a Jira system that mm -hmm. like you have like daily deliveries and mm -hmm. like it, it, there, there is a requirement of iteration for, for machine learning. If you have those pieces in place, that's the most important piece for mm -hmm. the success of a machine learning. Um, so elaborate on that. So, so from, I think I understand it, but maybe I didn't understand it. There's a difference in the fundamental DevOps process for software engineering to machine learning ops. Yeah. So the cycles and how you, you need to understand the differences 
to fit them together. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Is that what you said? Um, or, or do you please elaborate if I misunderstood. So uh, this was even before getting to a point that you're mm -hmm. building. Uh, so yes and no. So the first thing is that uh, you need a team that uh, basically understands or like a decision maker that understands to set out a longer time uh, timeline. Yes. And to your point, why this timeline, longer timeline is needed, uh, Google has a nice article about like, uh, actually, what is the differences between a traditional uh, software development and like a machine mm -hmm. learning uh, development? Um, which one? Is that the hidden technical debt thing or which paper is? There, in, after hidden tech, there is another one. I forgot the name. Um it actually really compares and also shows uh, a sco how, how you can score machine learning uh, oh, yeah. projects. So about testing in machine learning. Yeah, something. yeah, something yeah. like that. I, I just don't remember the yeah. name. Okay. Um, but um, so uh, in, in when you have uh, uh, machine learning, so there's a lot of certainty around uh, software engineering. In machine learning, uh, there is no certainty about, like, for instance, you have a lot of randomness uh, in your data, and you need to like test out for like quality of your data. You need to test about uh, feature importance of your your data, and then you need to monitor in a different way. And you also need a lot of um, uh, extra analysis to understand these uncertainties when you are building your, your model. So um, the cycles in are terms different. Are, are different. And then even before getting to, uh, this was assuming that you have a, an inf like a model in production, right? But even before that, uh, just the example that Andesh and I were discussing, um, that project, it was not a, like a one day work, it was like a, more than one day work mm -hmm. like even to get like to the first uh, first iteration you get an insight about data mm -hmm. so sometimes data exploration is under like undersold people mm -hmm. think it's it's easy just have a look at data but uh <laughs> that is actually maybe like two three weeks of work mm -hmm. for some cases mm -hmm. um so that's what i what i meant if you if you get that um if the, if the bandwidth, top management by seeing to this number one, to be committed mm -hmm. to support and understand that this takes, this yeah. is a different cycle. Yeah. But then get, talking about like, you know, these last pieces yes. uh, of like taking machine learning to, to production. Um, in, in the last project I worked in Spotify, we worked on like call the start pro problem and like building recommendation system for that. We spent like a month working on defining. So just to explain to people, cold start basically is when you have very little data about the song or a user and yeah, you want exactly. to still be able to recommend that. Yeah, way. so like user just signs up uh, and you don't know anything about the taste of user and you mm -hmm. want to build a still some recommendation to the user. So you want to mm, yeah, provide recommendation system on that. Um, I, I, I spent, like I think, a month on understanding our data, our model, and like I, I, because I was a data science product before, I had this good understanding of the metrics, and uh, doing a lot of predictive models, how and like uh, feature mapping to figure out how things correlate to each other to define a metric offline that is a good proxy for the online uh, performance then I felt more confident that, okay, now I can put this in production and test it and most likely it's successful. And so why do you want to have it offline and not simply use the online? Obvious uh, question, but still for <laughs> the people. Yeah. Well, I mean, first of all, you don't want to test like, you know, very bad performing model on your mm. users. I mean, you want to respect user experience. Yeah. Uh, so that's that's the key key piece, right? And also the cost of and there is a high tests and yeah, products and uh, exactly yeah. there is a high cost of like just you put something in production you need to build a lot of monitoring system around mm -hmm. it and the scheduling and and uh, um, there is a high cost of maintaining that model even if you live live it live for two weeks, right? And it needs to have certain standard. We wanted to test our models before. Like after, like just just in the prototyping phase, before we get to the high quality software standards, yeah. uh, to see okay, this is the right choice, and we go in this path. Mm -hmm. Yeah, mm -hmm. cool. So so there is a lot of things to for one, just you know, you do data exploration, you perhaps build some prototype, just train the models, and, and trying to see some 
value from that, but then actually putting in production, then you have a lot of steps to do there, and then you have a lot of maintenance as well, mm-hmm. just making sure it continues to work, I guess. Yeah. And, yeah. I think for, for maintenance, uh, one thing that people forget is that every single feature that you throw at your model mm. means that you also need to maintain a lot of underlying tables mm. that are actually building that particular, f- that, that feature comes from. Mm. So that means that not only introducing maintenance of your model, introducing maintenance to this particular data and the sequence of all the things that this depends on. Mm. So uh, people forget that this is this is a, actually a hidden cost to, mm. to con- consider. So not only models, but all the data dependencies and all the exactly. data pipelines and exactly. everything. You know, I guess Spotify had like 10,000 uh, pipelines running every day or something. How many do you think King has? It's probably a lot, right? Uh, it's a lot of data. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, cool. I think around the same scale. Mm. It's just different type of data. And, mm. and uh, let's talk a little bit about the difference and how you see the view of, um, we have talked now going to production, so we can talk about the, the vertical uh, going to production, like vertical, you know, really not going to INSA, but putting it in a, sy- uh, in a system for a user. What about the horizontal scaling to having many different pipelines or having many different algorithms in place? Mm-hmm. That's another dimension of scaling, I guess. Uh, that's a that's a good question. Um, I think so. For instance, now in my team, we like the particular example that I said about uh, playtesting mm-hmm. uh, and having a bot for for playtesting. Uh, we had a bot that was trained by applying supervised learning. So you look at the user data, you train the, you you train uh, the model to 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 be able to predict given the current state of the game what would be the next action, like what choice of matching the user does in, in, in Candy. Uh, then we started saying that, okay, if you want to do research, you want to also know how does the ra- random bot performs. Mm. Then we started saying that, okay, we want to try out reinforcement learning once. You start like a scaling and trying out a lot of different models. Mm. And then you see, and then while you are trying, like the whole game is moving and mm. like, you know, advancing, a lot of new content is coming and then you need to retrain your bot. So you get a lot of these challenges of you need to scale. So uh, you need a lot of automation. Mm. Uh, so we spent, uh, I think, not like, you know, full time, but like we spent like six months of time on building infrastructure mm-hmm. uh, where we can plug in, pl- plug in a lot of different uh, models. Uh, we can scale if the number of like, you know, uh, uh, game designers that they are using this level, this, this, this tool is like, it's suddenly increasing. We can scale the number of trials that we have and uh, we can scale with, we can automate the process of, using data from users and the changes of the game. So I think it was the time well spent oh. uh, because now it makes it much easier for us to iterate on what we do and have a better maintenance. But, but then, sorry, then I must ask you, do you and King have a clearly defined use case life cycle from an idea of what you want to uh, ideate that we should do this? Mm-hmm. There is a business guy saying, a product owner saying something, it goes into research. Ideation, validation, you know, do you have a clear path? I think path? I wish we get to that clear path. So mm-hmm. I think we are still not as mature uh, in, or like we don't have as many big use. Like if you get to a company that you have several use cases, mm-hmm. uh, I know, like a hundred use cases, mm-hmm. then you get to this, like you need to establish that. Uh, what I have been doing um, when I joined King was to establishing a research framework mm-hmm. uh, where I listed a few a, a set of uh, questions mm-hmm. where if you want to start a machine learning project, you need to answer those. Mm. Where, like, what is your data? What is the business method? AI canvas. <laughs> exactly. Uh, inspired from AI canvas very much. Uh, and like my experience mm-hmm. in few companies that I worked in. Um, that highlights where you need to talk to mm-hmm. whom and what kind of, uh, in order to start that project, what kind of skill sets you need for that project and when, uh, so that you can set out a project. And we help, like my team helps, uh, if a project is an external thing, helps them, uh, the teams to, to look at that. But, um, with like y'all, if you think about uh, use cases and life cycle again, like we don't have as mature cycles, but usually it needs to come from 
uh, if it doesn't come from our team, an idea, a proof of concept that we showcase, it should come from a need of the business. Mm -hmm. And usually there is some data science work that has happened around it. So there's insights about data, how much of an opportunity is, why we think machine learning can have impact. Then uh, uh, we have two formats. One is that we do a consulta consulting. So data scientists in game teams, they, uh, they work on a machine learning projects and we support them in terms of like, you know, research and they look at data and so on. Another one is that we start building something in, in my in my team, which we know that it takes it's more complex and it takes longer yes. period. I, mean, I think that's a very important question. And this is more about the organization of how to have data science teams and AI teams, etc. And I know we tried a number of things in yeah. Spotify for that. Uh, and, and you now have a, like an AI team. And you can think about, you know, pros and cons of having a central team perhaps being a bit disconnected to the product, but still you have the critical mass to actually have some really productive type of people. And then you can have consultants, as you said, that actually help product teams. What do you think the best way to do this is? Should data scientists be embedded in product teams? Should they have a central team? How, I, how should you do it? I think this is like a very <laughs> in, important topic close to my heart mm -hmm. because it's an unsolved problem, I yeah. would say. Uh, depends on the size of the company. So in smaller companies, I mean, in smaller startups, you want, you probably look for a different recipe than like a larger companies. I think the key factor is what you said, the critical mass. Mm -hmm. So if you have, you need a critical mass for each of them to work, mm -hmm. but I would go for a hybrid mm -hmm. because I think uh, it's important uh, to have a longer investment, so you need a research component right. that is more focused. Mm -hmm. But also, uh, I think research should not be very disjoint from product. Mm -hmm. So uh, I don't remember which company, but uh, one one of these big companies, uh, what they do is that if you, when you join a company, they send you to product teams. Mm -hmm. And then you are resident there for a month. Mm. You shadow people. You learn about like a lot of things. You learn about metrics, their challenges, mm. and then you go back uh, to your team. Right. So um, a hybrid system, I think, is good. Uh, where an example is that like if you have people that they can come to as an incubator join to the research if they want to do more research or like a research. mean going from product to research yeah. or vice versa? Both. 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 So, so, so having a good interaction. Yeah. Good. Mm -hmm. But but for, for any of these work, you need a critical mass, right? Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. um, that's why I say it's a hard thing to, to solve. Mm -hmm. But we, we have talked about this and uh, explore the organizational topic. Uh, if, if, I'm re if I'm relating back to the work I've been doing the last four or five years, uh, first with Vattenfall and now uh, on consultant basis um, with the uh, Scania, Grundfos. So this is in a more industrial setting and coming from a company with, which has a traditional analog business, right? And there is clearly a, a data literacy issue here. Mm -hmm. we, we actually talk uh, a lot, lot more about orchestration than organization. And what I mean with orchestration is the fundamentals of, if I look at the uh, use case lifecycle and I truly understand where's the business value, who owns the PNL, and in my case, who owns the people that's supposed to adopt uh, data-driven decision-making and stuff like this. It's like one business value stream from ideation to production to operations. And then we talk about the, the core uh, technology side, which we split up in the data science part and also the, the operations. And then we have, of course, a quite huge stream, which is simply data, data management, data governance, GDPR. So this whole orchestration piece, what about this? How do you do that? I think this is more important even than organization. I think... Um, uh uh, Gradient Descent company has done a good job on like, you know, uh, putting together uh, something called maturity index, mm -hmm. AI maturity index, uh, which is like, uh, I think when you start uh, looking at uh, starting an uh, like AI uh, orchestration uh, in, in a company, you need to first map out in all of these dimensions that you mentioned, like, you know, 
data, uh, people, business, um, uh, infra. infra, where you are, so that like you have a score on each dimension and you know where you are, and then you can start planning and uh, figuring out how how you can uh, you can solve it. I think in my case, I've been probably I have had the luxury of working with data driven people. Sometimes probably companies, data driven yeah. companies. I would even say. <laughs> but but I've also mm. seen if you move <laughs> from like for instance uh, when I worked in Spotify, if you m- move from one org to another, uh, one org is super data driven, the other one is not, and then you see a huge difference of mm. like the adoption or mm. like you know possibilities of like even like how that affects infrastructure work mm. and so on and so on. So, but still, like I had the luxury of working in the companies that they want to be data driven. Well, speaking about these two companies, then a, a bit, um, you have had the luxury or have the luxury to to work at two of the top Swedish tech companies. Mm. Um, and still, you know, if you were to try to compare them, uh, what do you think the differences between Spotify and King are? Um, difficult question <laughs> <laughs> to compare. Good question. <laughs> I think it depends. I mean, if you think about data uh, or you think about like products uh, or like culture, you see Mm. like different, different angles, right? Yeah. Uh, And uh, I think they are both like rather large companies. I would say like King is uh, probably larger in Stockholm um, than like other, other locations while Spotify it's probably more internationally spread. Mm. Uh, and that brings like some differences, like uh, like meetings, for instance, how many virtual meetings you have for, versus like in-person meetings. Which uh, one would you say is the higher number of meetings? Virtual meetings is Spotify, definitely. Mm. Because I had, for instance, half of my team in uh, sitting in New York and half of my team sitting yeah. in Stockholm. Um, but the Spotify, but, but King has been more like, you know, I've, usually have s- meetings with, with within Stockholm, mm. uh, sometimes meeting with London or Berlin mm. or, or, uh, or Barcelona, but, but it's, it's way much less. So your focus is more on the site. Mm. Uh, thinking about data, I would say uh, King is uh, probably having, have been mo- a lot focused on building a good infrastructure for, for A-B testing and automation of a lot of data science work that you do. So there's a lot of libraries and packages that is like, mm. oh, this makes my life super easy. Mm. Uh, I think Spotify has a really good uh, infrastructure, um, data infrastructure team. Mm. Um, and then when it comes to research, then of course, like Spotify has way much larger org uh, mm. for research, but I'm hoping that at King we can get there With too. With your help, they will get there, <laughs> right? But speaking about research, some people, or h- how would you describe the difference between a research team and a product team? Um, I think uh, we touched a bit on that, uh, that the cycle of work is very different. Mm. I remember I was in a, once I was in a product team or even an engineering team mm. once. Uh, and you want to tell them that, listen, this takes, it's, I can't put a Jira ticket mm. and say that, like, I check mark this one, like, in one day. Yeah, uh, scrum time box it. Yeah, scrum, that. yeah. <laughs> so uh, you get a lot of, especially if you are more junior, you get a lot mm. of anxiety of why am I not delivering while others mm. are delivering. Um, but, I mean, to, to be a bit more serious, I think um, the pace is... It, is, is different and mm. like the stress of like uh, delivery and the business request affects a lot of stra- uh, of decision makings mm. uh, and priorities uh, and yeah and also I think research teams probably spend less time on um, product quality work mm. so sometimes depending on how they are formulated like mm. in in our case we have a whole infrastructure as our focus but um, that means that like, there is also like, sometimes there's a technical depth mm. that like you have. Which one is the larger, uh, obvious kind <laughs> of question, but 
still. Uh, the technical depth, I, I mean, depends. If you think about a product team that has yeah. a strong engineering backbone, yeah. obviously they have a less technical depth. Yeah. But uh, in research team, you have a high, high technical depth. Yeah. But sometimes also if you go to a company where product team is just patching and they have a fast delivery and they are stressed mm. with like uh, delivering something, they might actually do a lot of duct taping, mm. which will break when you want to scale something. Uh, while research might think of, if you have like infrastructure uh, thinking, you might actually uh, think think that through uh, mm-hmm. in a better pace. Mm-hmm. Actually, we are m- mentioning now <coughs> infrastructure and, and how we do things. And actually for, for, for a, a traditional company, it's a little bit like looking from the outside at some sort of future world out there what is the infrastructure of 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 the core tech companies and maybe even contrasting spotify's infra and uh, and kings so really be uh, let us be a little bit concrete now because if if you go to a a a place like vattenfall and scania which has a huge infrastructure which is a legacy all technical depth in one way (laughs) Um, and we are trying to figure out how to deal with slas of 2000 systems right that now should fit into a platform. So we are all challenged and struggling to understand if this, what is this infra? So could you tell us a little bit about what we are talking about concretely here? Um, yeah, I think uh, probably Anders can talk a lot about Hadoop. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> Back in Spotify. May I please? No. No, but let's start with King. I think. <laughs> what's, what's the fundamental stuff? I think, King? yeah, so both King and Spotify are using Google Clouds mm-hmm. as uh, infrastructure for infrastructure. Uh, Spotify joined, uh, moved probably much earlier, uh, not much earlier, but like a couple of years earlier than Spotify, uh, at, than King. Uh, so that's so the cloud infrastructure. That's the cloud so infrastructure. So what do you actually use there and compare to all the open source and uh, everything else? Uh, I think... Um, <laughs> but that's also part of cloud infrastructure, right? So, like, oh, we, if you do use, it, it's good. We we use BigQuery, um, but also I I'm, I'm just trying. Like for instance, we we use quite intensively also Kubernetes. Mm-hmm. I guess it's the same at the Spotify now. And now uh, you can do you can use Kubernetes in different ways. You can do it yeah. more natively, or you can do it yeah. completely open source. Yeah, or even more packages. But uh, then I think. Programming language, we I think both companies have freedom for data scientists to use Python and R, but I think uh, people use mostly Python. So Julia is not really kosher yet. <sighs> we have we have had some Julia fans on the on the show. <laughs> yeah, I I know, but I think uh, at least to the best of my knowledge, at least until two years ago that I was in a Spotify, uh, it was not. Um, no, but Python yeah. is the dominant language. We I mean, it's different in a research team and a yeah. product team, of course. Yeah, yeah, I mean, exactly. you, you need to have much stricter like requirements, yeah. of course, if so something is important. Ex- exactly. Like yeah, the moment that you want other people be able to read your code and maintain your code, and then mm. like have like test unit tests that you can test things, you get to. Um, I sh- I would use Python. I don't even use R no. there. If I want to do fast hack, maybe yes, for statistics, R is really good. Uh, but again, I'm not expert in R, so I'm I have a biased view here. So you're Same Python, for Julie. You 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 live in Python. <laughs> yeah, or, ten, and ten or TensorFlow. Or TensorFlow. TensorFlow. Yeah, Python. Python probably more than TensorFlow because you do more data analysis mm-hmm. than exactly. like you know uh, spending the proportion of time that you spend. Uh, so if 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 we needed to define you by the programming language, who are you? You're a Python girl. <laughs> <laughs> Probably I should say TensorFlow. You should say t- <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I would. I, well, you asked me how, like, what's my day to day? Yes. And I said meeting. Uh, but would I define myself as like a no. meeting person? No, I would define myself as a research person. Perfect. So it's the same goes with Python and TensorFlow. So uh, if I good think answer. about. Very yeah. good answer. Yeah. So speaking about TensorFlow and just digging a bit deeper into that, what do you think about the 2.0 release and, you know, if you compare it to PyTorch, is it and the eager execution and everything? So PyTorch, I've coded only like maybe a couple of times there. So mm. I'm like at zero level mm. of uh, expertise and opinion. 
uh, tens- the same goes for TensorFlow 2.0. Mm-hmm. Um, but um, I think what I can compare is like Keras and TensorFlow 2.0 mm-hmm. because uh, um, I think they kind of look the same. Mm-hmm. Uh, I think we we had our libraries, for instance, in um, TensorFlow 1.x. Uh, we just moved them to TensorFlow 2.0 okay. and like we have been like testing recently of like, you know, what differences we see. Mm. Of course, we had to spend some time on um, like, you know, doing the adaptation, um, but also meant a lot of like performance things are fixed, mm. uh, um, like code optimization, distributed work is much easier. Uh, and like, it's also more readable, I mm. would say, and easier for testing. So Moving in the right direction, at least. I, I yeah. would, I would say so. But again, like you know, if I want to say myself being hands on, mm-hmm. I haven't been uh, as much on TensorFlow 2.0. Mm-hmm. Uh, so it's a lot of like you know pairing up and like reviewing or like uh, secondhand yeah. information from my team. Yeah. yeah. And what is the biggest frustration in the tech stack or where we are right now? What, where, where is it? Like, can't they use figure out how to do? What is it that sort of you think is what they really should aim for to do better? Mm. Where is the tech going? Where's the open? Where's this going? What do we need to be do better? I think. Okay, so you you can look at it from different perspectives. One is like open source, mm-hmm. right? Uh, and like come contributing to open source things. Mm. Uh, so that's one side of thing to look at. Uh, that I would like to see tech going t- uh, towards day to day work. What is more, I think it's just, there's so many of them. Mm. And then like you get to a point that you need to decide and then like, you know, this all of a sudden is changing and then you need to adapt to another uh, new package or your team is deciding on something and and while another team is deciding something else and how do you do like the the common language, I would say. And how do you steer that in King? Do you you care or do you try to have a standard or embodies to... to do you have like guilds and chapters and stuff like that to try to figure this out together? So I think guilds and chapters are much stronger at uh, at Spotify mm-hmm. um, in, because they, I mean, the organizational aspect is very different. So mm-hmm. at Spotify, you have um, um, horizontal and vertical in a sense that uh, you have uh, in each organization or like a um, a, a mission or a tribe you have uh, engineering you have product you have designers you have uh, iOS developers. to solve the, yeah. the tribe should solve their purpose. exactly so this yeah. cross-functional thing moves all the way from like the top to the bottom everywhere you see cross-functional until like this the smaller team mm-hmm. are also cross-functional right um at king you have uh, a lot of games right mm. uh, and each game is like its own company it's a and company within the company. It's a PNL within the company. Yes. So, and that 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 company has these cross-functional teams, but then you also have this uh, tech organization that is supporting all of Crossing these things. Crossing, for instance, and and the 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 um, the, the, uh, the shared tech, uh, mm, share tech. org. Uh, is basically picking up the pieces that is common between, I guess, TK, SDKs that are common between all of different games uh, and is maintained by them. Or like, you know, we have some uh, platforms like unified platforms that mm. uh, that like all of the tools that are provided are, are within that. But I would say I have like, uh, like not enough knowledge to go through the details of those, but because, and the reason is like the nature of my team and my work, uh, no. which is, we have a lot of fl- flexibility while mm. we build tools and like, you know, test our ideas. And then we need to figure out how to map this to, um, to a product. Yeah. And, uh, so this is fascinating. And especially if you're not working in some of these companies, mm. it is a different world. <laughs> and it's very, very nice to, to peek a little bit mm. how it looks. So the time is really flying away here and we've spoken quite a lot uh, about King now and about you and we have a number of other topics that you have Mm -hmm. worked with that I'd love to cover as as well. But just a final point because I I think what you are doing right now in trying to accelerate research or innovative thinking in King, 
how would you recommend a company that feels a bit, you know, they, they're just focusing on the coming two, three months and, and doesn't really have the like innovative thinking in a proper way? What's the best way for a company to get started having this type of thinking? Mm-hmm. Depends on the size of the company that we are talking mm-hmm. about. Mm-hmm. Um, so a couple of hundred people, perhaps? I think the most important thing is that, like, um, the C level and the VPs are on board, mm-hmm. committed, yeah, committed to take this mm-hmm. uh, because you hit the wall of uh, sponsorship, you hit the wall of uh, time is investment. So, like mm-hmm. after three months, if your team doesn't deliver, mm-hmm. like, will you still keep the team? Do mm-hmm. you see the value or not? So, uh, I would say like some trainings. For for and if, that level, C level needs to be. If a C level people come and speak to you, why? Uh, how how would you describe to that C level person why research is important? Um. So I think, again, I look at like which function of C level we are talking about. Like talking to a CTO would be mm-hmm. very different to talking to a CPO, right? And mm-hmm. uh, so you make some assumptions on on the background. Um, I think if you, it's, it's a matter of, if you like, for instance, if you are, when I started, uh, learning how to drive, mm. my dad was telling me that like, if you are driving and you just look at like two meters front of you, mm. there's a high chance of having an accident while like mm, the, the key to success is to look far. So mm. if you want to keep your, yourself be- between the lanes, just look far. Mm. And that's, I think, uh, the yeah. message, Good right? Analogy. Good okay. message. Yeah. So, so if you want to go in the right direction, you actually need to look further to keep the car in yeah. the lane. That's a really good analogy. And I mean, the other thing is that I think it's a matter of like a bit, a bit demis- demystifying AI right. because a lot of C levels might come and uh, VP or VPs come and say that, uh, hey, I've heard this cool thing. Why don't we have that in our product? It's mm. like, okay, hold on a minute. So <laughs> let's have a chat. So helping them to demystify what AI can do and yeah. what AI cannot do right. is another thing that I would spend time I like on. That. Cool. Um, I think one very interesting thing is uh, RoboCup, which I know you have been um, involved with quite a lot. And you've been too. (laughs) And now, what is this? (laughs) Yeah, with I, you, not with O, RoboCop with yeah, you. Yeah, I heard RoboCop, (laughs) but it's (laughs) RoboCop. Yes. Um, So I remember my first meeting, I think it was in 2001 or something. I was in each Kai conference uh, somewhere and they they had the Robo, Robo Cup. <laughs> so what is uh, it? You need to frame it a little bit, I think. Perhaps you can do it better. Yeah. I, yeah, otherwise, yeah. How, how would you describe uh, Robo Cup? Uh, so Robo Cup goal is, I mean, the symbolic goal is um, by the year, now I forgot if it's 2025 or 2050. Uh, 2050, I think. 2050, I think, yeah. The, to have a team of uh, robots that can play football versus human. Uh, and that's a symbolic goal. It consists for, to achieve that goal, it consists of a lot of, uh, different, uh, leagues. Uh, so you have a uh, simulation league, 2D, 3D, you have, uh, middle size robots, you have like a small size robots, uh, you have humanoid robots. And so some, some of the, uh, some of the leagues are focused on, you have, let's say you have a now humanoid lo- uh, robot mm. that, uh, you need to deal with the mechanics and the, the vision. So like uh, for, for the research, right? To balance and they, they play football against, against each other. When it comes to middle size and a small size, it's a lot of computer vision and some uh, like decision make, making and collaboration between, between the players. And then you get to simulation uh, where you have uh, in 2D, you have, and I, I come from the simulation, by the way, mm. you have a t- team of 11 versus 11. Or you have like a simulated 3D uh, agents that are like a sm- smaller number of uh, agents. And this is where you can have more complicated algorithms without worrying about the mechanics and computer vision side. Uh, and and it's a big difference between simulation and the... 
Yeah. Not simulation. Yeah, so, exactly. So, exactly. So it's so cute to picture, look at some of the videos, by the I don't really <laughs> paint the picture. So I, what, what is it that I look at? How does it work? When you do the simulation, mm -hmm. what is it actually all about? So it's, it's distributed AI domain. Uh, what you, what you, so the thing is that you are actually developing one agent. Uh, and what is an agent in, in the field of the simulation? So let's say a player. A so player you, are, you, are, you, have a, you have a simulated player mm -hmm. and uh, um, this player looks at the position of the, uh, the field and where the other players they are and, uh, can, and should choose whether to pass, to do shoot. a dribble or to shoot, mm -hmm. right? Uh, and, or to position if they... If the Move position. To which, which, yeah, which position to, uh, to, to stay waiting for a ball. Mm -hmm. or to intercept it, right? And so you don't tell to the agent, go here, go here, and go here. That would be uh, not an, a, like a distributed AI. Here you have an autonomous agent uh, that can decide independently and like they can play together. So um, that's the complexity that we bring in. So, and what is the definition of distributed in this context? Several agents, several yeah, players. Exactly. So you have several players that, in, that should make decisions in interaction with the rest so they observe uh, so you mm. you have an observation sense the environment mm. uh think sense think act right so Ooh, the, uh, <laughs> each agent does like observe the environment thinks what is the right thing to do and makes an action and this t this this group of agents are collaborating together yeah. to reach a goal which is like winning against the the other team scoring a goal yeah, yeah exactly Football. yeah yeah and what, what's the real, comp what's the biggest complication in, in all this? So, um, I mean, I, I was in, so I, I participated, my first RoboCup was in 2004 and I was working in RoboCup until 2010. So participants, uh, organizer and like, uh, executive. So uh, fun. So yeah. much fun. And, uh, uh, it has changed quite a bit, like since I left, but, um, I think, um, I mean, the biggest challenge depends. I mean, you have a limited, like for instance, in you, you have, you might also introduce some constraints of limited vision, the stamina, limited stamina, those also becomes mm -hmm. a challenge challenge or like introducing a coach into the, could be also a challenge. Uh, I think the most complex thing is the, yeah, I don't know. I mean, it's the whole challenge. It, all of it is together a challenge. Like you have basic skills yeah. and it's the decision making. Like when is the right time given the whole configuration and yeah. like the other agents, when is the right time to do what? And how does it work? How much do you work at home preparing for the cup? And how is, mm -hmm. or is this like a hackathon where this is all happening? So it's uh, a week of events. Mm -hmm. uh, so like you have like conferences. So of course you have to submit at this again, like it's my, my knowledge might be a bit outdated. So you have to submit a team description. It's like a paper saying what you have done, what your what are like the solutions that you're using. So you come with a team to compete. Yes. So we so were, yeah, we were a team of eight. Um, so you need to train your team before they show up. <laughs> I love it. So uh, you, you write, you write a team description. You also, send the binary of, uh, your, like a exec of, uh, your, uh, Gosh. team. Yep. And, uh, then, uh, that would be run on the, uh, actual, uh, simulation environment on like, a uh, like the winner of last year, for instance. <laughs> and then like, they look at how your team performs and, uh, from, uh, the technical, the organizing committee chooses, chooses the team. So and the, the, there's like the qualifier to get into the finals. Yeah, exactly. Fantastic. And then, and then there's also a limit on, uh, teams per country, mm -hmm. uh, so that you have a more diverse from different continents and countries, uh, during the, the competition. So then you spend time after you're qual qualified, prepare your team. Uh, and then you have like the same as football. So you have like a split, um, you submit different your groups. Exactly. And every day you submit your binary and then like your day play the day after you go to the next round. So you might want to do some improvements. So you can coach your team in between. Yeah. You can, you can learn <laughs> this team is really good at this. I need to, I need to tweak yeah. the code here. Yeah. Fantastic. 
yeah and and it's so fun it's uh it's like it's funny that because you look at the the, the screen and you see your agent and start like shouting but you're not <laughs> in a stadium right but uh it's, I, I bet you should have t-shirts and you should have the uh, yeah. but but talking about like research in that domain like a lot of work in reinforcement learning if you talk mm. about if you talk to the community in robocop you see that they've done a lot of work in reinforcement learning and now it's becoming a hot topic or like neural network mm. um it's become a hot, very hot topic um, and that has been there for, for a long period and it's so nice to be part of that community. And uh, what's your involvement in RoboCup? Yeah, well, a lot of history there, but um, I think one interesting comment, if you go back to Kasparov, you know, the when he beat uh, Deep Blue back in 97, he basically said this thing, I can feel it, I can smell it, it's a new kind of intelligence across the board. And he knew very well how the Deep Blue algorithm software worked. It's, you know, searching a big uh, you know, tree and, and trying to find, you know, the best move forward. And it seems simplistic, but when it all comes together, it, you know, it's emerging some kind of intelligence in mm -hmm. some way. Yeah. And, you know, when you competed and, and you wrote and, and understood exactly how the software worked, should you sometime, you know, be surprised with how the team that played actually uh, worked or i think because there's that uh, there is a dynamic there and mm. that's like the other team mm. right so it's it's hard you sometimes you get also surprised you mm. you have a certainty of like if you spend enough time to train your agent and watch it like how it performs you have a certain expectation as you know how it works mm. but uh, yeah the dynamic factor from from the other team Mm -hmm. uh, might surprise you sometimes, but th there is, I don't know. I mean, there is a surprise and not surprise. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. I was very surprised. I remember in 2001 when I saw the simulation league and I, I th there were like a number of universities in the U S and other countries that competed and it was one university that was so, you know, extremely dominating everyone else. And, um, the only thing, you know, everyone has to reprogram when they met this university and said, you know, we have to play as defensive as we can. So we don't, you know, as, shame ourselves too much and lose with too much <laughs> points and i think they only lost with 11 to 0 and that was actually a good thing <laughs> <laughs> because the other one was so good we we got the third place award oh, for, yeah, yeah in nice. uh, in the 3d competition the first awesome. year of 3d competitions yeah. which year was that 2004 four uh, and what was it yeah. and how, what the team how were you, were you working on it a couple of people together in your so we research were group? eight people mm -hmm. uh half of us were working mostly focused on the 2d uh, and the half of us uh four of us we were mm -hmm. working on on uh, the 3d mm -hmm. yeah and that was yeah we were bachelor students back then mm -hmm. good fun yeah it was and speaking about the vision then you know do you think the um, sh the robot champion in 2050 will be the human champion mm -hmm. in soccer Mm, well, I'm not sure about, be but uh, okay, I have to say one thing. So I played, uh, by the way, in one, so there is every time that there's the event, there's also mm. this symbolic match mm. where like trustees of RoboCop that they're like, you know, uh, more senior in the field, they play versus robots. Um, humanoids, I mean? Not humanoids. You, the, mean that you take an agent and have someone you can control each. So there's a there's a league called um, middle size, and mm. they are this size robots, and they have three wheels. They are like a like a oops, I'm sorry, pyramid, mm -hmm. uh, and uh, they run very fast. And you have a big field that they come compete, and they also can throw the ball three dimensions. Mm. Um, and then like you have trustees, like three versus three, for instance, or I, I don't remember how many, but like you have a smaller than 11 that playing in the field. So once back I was in Iran and like there was a local event in Iran and I got into playing mm -hmm. against those and uh, it was super scary <laughs> because you don't want to hold the ball when they want run, they are running. If you'd feel like, yeah. I'm not sure if this will really stop. Mm -hmm. So, um, I think there is a chance, um, but um, I mean, it's hard to say. I think we get, uh, th there's a lot of work that has been now in in, in humanoid uh, mm. dom domain. But still extremely rudimentary, right? Or yeah, but uh, we're talking about t 30 years. Mm. So <laughs> yeah. I guess like 30 years is a good amount of time if you look at the trajectory mm. of what has been achieved in the past 10 years. 
But I think, you know, a lot of people don't understand the challenges with robotics yeah. as, as a technique, you know, and, and if you compare that's just, you know, having to, to develop the software and using AI for that, and then suddenly controlling some kind of physical robot, which is extremely underperforming yeah. today, right? I think there's, uh, there's a lot of factor there. So talking about like, you know, taking research to products, yeah, exactly. uh, I think it's, this is, this is, <laughs> this is goes to the same direction. Um, you assume your data has no noise mm. uh, and then like you build something and like in simulation it's much easy, right? The moment that you have just a noise because like one of the motors of like a joint of mm. the bo- the robot is not working properly, then how would you balance that? That becomes like a, a challenge. Mm. And uh, there's so much noise on like, you know, image uh, processing of, of the agents that that factors in. Also, it's like the how soft is uh, the grass, uh, the artificial grass. And like if you, if you change the softness, mm. uh, it can totally affect the balance of the bot. So, and the yeah. lighting and, what's and so the many light things. condition. Uh, yeah, exactly. So many things. Uh, it's fun to see uh, one of the, the sm- small size leagues or these kind of Sony, Sony iBot robots, yeah. the, the dog kind of yeah. robots that they had. It was so fun to see them because they used like the tail, like a debug signal. So you can actually move the tail as well with the software and then you can use it to see you know if the yeah robot agent dog is feeling confused or not and i i know one team they basically programmed the tail to do a certain thing when they felt confused and you can see the robots moving about and then a lot of them raise the tail and they're, oh, they're confused, <laughs> they're confused. <laughs> <laughs> and i think it really makes you, you this kind of notion of anthropomorphization you know when you actually try to attribute some kind of human-like character to even robots, it's really strong, right? Yeah. Wouldn't you say so? Yeah, yeah I, I, I agree. Yeah. But, um, I mean, I mean, if I want to, like, you know, go back to the question you get, you mm. asked about, like, 2050 yeah. and the symbolic goal, I would, I would probably rather not to answer the question mm. because I would rather focus on how much we can achieve mm-hmm. during these 30 years by having these good platforms. Of, mm. of research right. uh, and I think that's the best you can get out of these platforms mm. I'd like to have a prediction from you as well <laughs> though that would be even <laughs> I want to move in a, in a slightly different direction that where we have talked about but I would like to talk a little bit about uh, the, the talent and the people aspects of data and AI and, and moving even also into the adoption I mean like how to get people to adopt it so but let's start from a talent perspective how should we think about uh, attracting, retaining talent? How should we think about career patterns, uh, career ladders, or whatever you, we should call it in, oh in gosh, this field? Oh gosh, there's so many things. <laughs> so, but let's let's start from. So I give a, a quite wide open field, mm-hmm. and and please take us away in in the direction. I think we can think about uh, how we do like uh, talent retention in Sweden. Yes. We can think about how we actually define talent Mm -hmm. in companies. We can think about what actually in this field uh, mean to join and like, you know, um, change, like go from a software engineer to AI or like move around and like, you know, change jobs, change jobs and so on. And how, and then we can also think about what does career path, career path is, it means in this domain because Mm -hmm. it's very different in my opinion from software engineering but here uh, maybe we should take them a little bit step yeah. by step which order is the best to to go into the topic do you think uh, I don't so know. what is talent <laughs> well, let's start here what, what's what's the do we have a good definition of talent i think recruit for talent not for competence is one statement i've heard yeah i think so you know i, I mean Talking about myself, I've been moving around quite a lot in different companies, mm-hmm. and uh, mm-hmm. I, I, that meant also like I've gone to interviews in mm-hmm. different companies, mm-hmm. and uh, probably like now that I'm more senior, I have this privilege to choose. Mm-hmm. Uh, where, while when you are junior, you don't have that much privilege, um, but you get a sense of during the interview what this team is looking for. You get a sense of the type of questions they ask you, what they look for. Mm. 
And I think a lot of companies, they tend to uh, have questions. So I'm not, okay, so let me go one step back. I'm not talking about like big companies like Google um, because it's so large that you need to have some processes around like, you know, interviews and like filtering candidates. But I'm talking about like, you know, reasonable sizes in Sweden more. Mm -hmm. Um, So a lot of companies, they give either assignments or like do a filtering of of, uh, tech filtering Mm. that is very specific. Mm. So like... Fact oriented, what do you mean? No, they give you a very specific task that if you if you happen to work in exactly this field, you nail it, right? So but as you, a, for instance, as a data scientist, you work with BigQuery, mm-hmm. uh, not BigQuery, sorry, SQL quite mm-hmm. a lot. And uh, then if, and, and statistics. So you can ask fundamental questions in statistics or mm-hmm. go to like a very recent um, thing or like, you know, a very con- super complex uh, SQL to yeah. just and and you lose the person in in that like you know filtering, yeah. the filtering should be really filtering. Does the person knows the basics, and then I think it should be the next step should be like can so like when when I'm interviewing for instance I'm looking at um, can this person explain something that they really know well? Mm-hmm. Can this person explain uh, something? that uh, doesn't, like the person doesn't feel super comfortable about or like confident about. And if we come up with a new topic that this person doesn't know during the discussion, how does the person reason about? And then I get a sense of, I want to invest time because it's also my time investment, right? I want to invest time to bring in this person. And I think this is like a really good talent for my team and that i call a talent yes and this is i think a key topic now recruit for talent and not competence yeah. because the, 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 this test is really set up to measure competence in just what happened to be that test yeah I, I, it's not a really good metric for talent yeah well i mean i think so of course i want to have like you know check marks of the person knows like baseline very basic. competence yeah, yeah so, exactly so there is a baseline clear yeah yeah, and then also if the person has like analytics uh, reasoning skills, then. But, but what other talent? I mean, like coding skills to me to be a successful ML engineer in a context of putting things in production, it's is it even 10, 20 percent? I'm I'm just exaggerating here. What, what about uh, persuasion, explanation, mm-hmm. uh, taking people, working in a team? There's so many other things here. I think you. N- need to think about like if you're talking about the junior again Mm -hmm. or i'm Mm -hmm. like a more senior person of course a more senior person i expect the person to be able to mentor Mm -hmm. uh, convey the message be able to uh, connect the dots Mm -hmm. uh, to the product Um, so even if it's like you know just like you would be a machine learning engineer that it does continuously coding i want to see the person can see the big picture right um but I think you still need some 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 knowledge of like your field. So like the coding, I would say, is there. So uh, so there is clearly a baseline. Of there course. is a clearly a baseline that you yeah. you need. The problem that I see currently is that this baseline is not right. So like for instance, like especially you look at you have seen probably this circulated in like LinkedIn probably that. Like uh, 15 years of experience in machine learning development. This field mm-hmm. is not even like de- deployment of machine learning is not it's even 15 crack. years, it's right? So, and you'd expect that from a junior. Uh, so the, uh, the adjustment doesn't exist there. So it should be a, like a reasonable baseline and you evaluate for that baseline. And you, you highlighted another thing here is also that the most m- modern techniques right now could possibly come up from the juniors who just been, been happened to work in the last versions while if i go into a, 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 a bigger traditional company i can tell you they've been stuck in older versions mm-hmm. and they are not they are maybe from an infra perspective very very limited to what they really should be working on so they haven't uh, de- deployed open source at all yeah and i think there's again like if you have the luxury of time Mm-hmm. So, and you want to pick the right people in your team. Like for instance, uh, we have hired a few ML engineers or AI engineers recently. And we had a lot of discussions in my team of like, what profile do we yes. look at? And then we started looking at what is the current state of the team? 
what is mm-hmm. the need, what kind of skill sets we have currently in the mm-hmm. team. Mm-hmm. So sometimes the hiring has been more focused on we need someone who Filling is in. more hands-on on engineering side. Fitting this. Yeah. So And then we start adjusting the whole process of looking at the engineering. Mm-hmm. And then sometimes it's that I need someone who is like really good at, at research. Mm-hmm. So that's if you have the luxury of time, that would be really good to think about on what percent should be the coding, what percent should be mm-hmm. the research. But uh, I would say analytics and basics should be there, definitely. Yeah. And who writes a good job advert? Who, who should do the recruitment? GPT-3, right? GPT-3, <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, I mean... Yeah. Is it you? I mean, like, so I, 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 I'm asking this directly from a very, from a yeah. traditional company point of view. You can almost read it in the job advert that they are trying, but they don't really know what this is all about. And you, this actually sends a lot of signals to the applicant of the maturity. I think um, there is a lot of, even if you are like, you know, you have spent a lot of time being both sides of the table, being hired or hiring. There's still a lot of iterations that you need to do in order to get a good ads out because mm. things like the whole dynamic of like role definitions and yes. expectations of people um, and what your team needs. Uh, so I'm not saying that like, you know, like we are putting the best ads out, but uh, I would say it makes sense to for the team or the hiring, like the people actually work with the person be involved be yes so uh and, and then also iterate that with hr yes so because hr sometimes has really good points of like you know maybe you need to structure that is clear enough for people mm-hmm. but um yeah so mm. good points cool and uh in, in the last couple of minutes perhaps uh, some additional topics that we may be able to cover very briefly at least but um i, I want to make sure we get to the career path dimension of HR talent. Could we do that first? Yeah, yeah, sure. Because this one, I think, is a quite interesting topic. What is the different career path in in machine learning and AI? And and what's your thoughts here? I think, yeah, I mentioned that this is different a bit about between like ML and maybe like software engineering. The thing is that if you think about uh, industrialization, Mm -hmm. it has a long history. And then you have like, you know, the blue colors and like white colors and so on. Um, There has been like a structure way. You get to a job, you advance your job, and then you become a manager. And then like you become like a more senior manager and you continue and then you own a company or you become a CEO. Uh, And then uh, like things become more and more complex. Then you also need like people staying in the individual contributor track. But the career path is not as clear compared to management. So like, you know, especially like when you get to data and uh, machine learning, you have so many dimensions of like where you can focus on that like even your manager might get confused of like how to assess that you are senior enough to 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 move. So it's so so sometimes it's like as a data scientist, it's so frustrating to find our machine learning uh, engineer is so frustrating to find out what are you getting measured against and then what is the alternative than being a manager um i think there is this like i i i i think like there is like this third pillar of like you know you also need tech leads yes. or you also need uh product uh, machine learning product managers mm-hmm. as well mm-hmm. that are missing in those career steps and I would like to see that is like, you know, becoming more in, in, into the career steps. Right. And this whole HR map and what is really HR and their, how, what they should do and contribute in order to, for us to become data and AI ready. It, it is a quite massive task where they, they have a quite huge steep learning curve to do from the simple to support in job description. I mean, like we can't even talk about it ourselves, defining yeah. what is different going into training and competences for the experts to the data literacy and then now coming into career ladder and also fte balancing you know how many of each role do i need for a balanced team is it two engineers and one data scientist or vice versa i don't know hr doesn't know for sure yeah so there's a huge topic here yeah Yeah. i mean i like what you say about like ml and ai is is sort of becoming like an 
integral or like a ubiquitous part of any kind of role, including like product managers or whatnot. Yeah. They they should have a core understanding or even specific you know paths to make sure that that's like a normal part of yeah. of your job anyway. Yeah, yeah. I think you're you're onto something here because you can find the third part here that where you come product owner for an AI intensive service. Yeah, yeah that's exactly. a cool job. Yeah. Cool. Um, so not very very many minutes left, um, but I'm, I'm a bit struggling about choose with which topic to choose here, but. Um, I think um, I would like to hear a bit about you know research in AI, and uh, especially about how the you know conferences work, how the reviewing works, and you know having the kind of preprints that we have on archive today. Will there be? Let me start with, to make this very quick. Let me start with a controversial question: Do you think like archive will take over more and more, and like big conferences will reduce in? importance in the future? Uh, I'm not sure. <laughs> I think um, there, there, there comes some pros and cons with archive. Mm. Uh, so it's really good to see there are more work that is getting out there, especially like if you think about big conferences, like uh, um, in, in, in machine learning, the acceptance rate are like 18%, mm. 20%, 10%. And then uh, if you think about the number of submitted, it's every year, if you look at like the trends every year, the number of submitted work gets, it keeps increasing. Mm. Uh, so that means that uh, your work that is really good might have had a lot of chance like five years ago because there were less, less mm. number of like submitted papers, but this year you are competing. Mm. It's not about the quality necessarily only, a, of course there's a filtering, but it's not necessarily, if you are rejected in a conference, it doesn't mean that it's not a good quality work. It's just, yeah. it's not in that 10%. Yeah. And then there's also whole discussion about whether like the reviews are set out correctly. Yeah. Mm. Uh, so it's good that you get a lot of work out there that you mm. can use, but then it's also hard to measure the quality. Yeah. So how do you know this work is actually reproducible? How do you know this, the foundation is like, you know, mm, making sense? Mm -hmm. so, I so would like to see, sorry, I, don't know. Yeah, I, I would like, like to probably see, uh, I mean, like a, a pool that people can like be reviewers there both from industry and from, from academia, because very often it's like you go to a conference, it's applied machine mm. learning, and you don't have anyone from industry to evaluate whether mm. this is a good one, right? Yeah. So wow. to get a pool of reviewers and then like people can subscribe, you can verify the quality of the reviewers and then like you can get help from them mm. uh, to sometimes to, to, to get a review of the work, even if it goes to archive, not mm. necessarily to a conference. And then you say this has this badge yeah. of acceptance. So for me, who doesn't know, what is archive versus of conferences, I understand, but is it, what does it mean? Well, a archive uh, is, how long ago was archive? Oh, I starting? think it's 20 years now. Yeah. I don't know. It's a, it's a, it's a, it's a portal where you have, uh, like, you can submit your paper. Yep. During, within the domain of computer science, and then you can't and, other and, and others, others yeah. but it's mu much more like you it know, started in computer science. Yeah, it sure. started in computer science, and uh, you can't just like you know upload something in archive. You also need someone who has been like an archive uh, author. Uh, authored a, a paper in archive, or at least a few papers in archive, that recommends uh, or refers you to to upload. Uh, uh, so there are some mechanisms to, uh, there is a reviewing process. I mean, in there some is way. a big problem, of course, with the conferences. It takes a really long yeah. time to get into top conferences and, um, and then the, the whole development and research in AI goes so much faster. So fast. Yeah, exactly. Than, than that. So much work yeah. being done, by the way. Yeah. And then they also have the, the whole, um, I'm not sure if you heard about uh, Jeffrey Howard, you know, he's the founder of Fast AI and yeah. previous president of Kaggle. And, and he said in a Lex Friedman podcast, I believe, um, the research in deep learning today is uh, mainly a complete waste of time. Um, partly referring to like uh, it's a lot of companies like Google, Facebook, Amazon of the world that competes in getting the top of the leaderboard of some score for you know some academic data set that they, they want to perform on. 
but that's not really the problem of the industry. That's not really the problems that uh, companies that want to really make use of AI face. Yeah. And there's so much lacking research in that other field. Would you agree with that? Or yeah, I I agree. I mean, I think there's there's a lot of value of like doing research in machine learning uh, mm. deep learning. But I agree. I mean, a very good example. I don't think he said, you know, it's not useful to do research in deep learning. He just said the type of research done today is potentially. Yes. Yeah, I agree. Right. I, I, I agree in a sense because the, the very good example I can bring is from gaming. Mm. Uh, so let's say you have um, deep mind uh, uh, solution to mm. beat uh, Alpha. Alpha yeah, yeah, so to beat Go, uh, like uh, Lee Sedo at Go, uh, in Go, and then... Is that the bot that I want to use in like product development testing? Mm. No, I want a bot that can do human-like play testing because I want to know if this is like an inequality that I can uh, present it to my 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 player. So the so the, the 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 type of algorithm you need would is totally changing, right? Yeah. So in that sense, I think there is a huge gap and that needs to be addressed. Mm. But at the same time, I think. Uh, the research that is happening in academia that is a bit like on sandbox uh, is also valuable for like, you know, industry to pick up. Mm -hmm. You don't have in industry, like, you know, a lot of bandwidth of doing crazy exploratory work. So you can spend a percentage of that. And it's good to be able to do that together by, by, by academia. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Cool. I think we should um, start to, to round off, even yeah, though I have, I have yeah. a long backlog here of other and things. And I was I'd looking like at my watch <laughs> and I was what, what, what happened now? You know, two, cool. two hours. But uh, Sahar, it, it's been a true pleasure to have you here, of course. Uh, what's happening next in your life? Um, yeah, I, I think there's like, uh, there's so much that I feel like I've been missing that I, I need to, to pick up. So like, yeah, a bit spend more time hands-on. That's uh, for 2.0. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, I think I like to, I like to grow my team and like, you know, to, to expand the work that we do in research. I really, so there are two things that is like my passion that we discussed here. So like one is um, being able to bring research into products responsibly. So like looking at AI, responsible yeah. AI some, is a topic that topic I wish we had time to discuss. But <laughs> that yeah. I want to spend more time on yeah. and maybe start writing something. I think you can steal five minutes. And, uh, <laughs> it's a good one. And then I think it's also about women in data science. Right. So mm-hmm. that's where the two areas that I, I would like to continue. Mm. And I really admire the, the work you're doing there because it's something we dearly need. And, uh, you really need it and, uh, and because it will be better for sure. Yeah, I, I hope so. <laughs> no, <for sure. laughs> I know so. So, uh, yeah, cool. And uh, if you were to suggest someone that you would like to actually listen to on this podcast, who would you like to come here or listen to on this podcast? Um, okay, that was a difficult one. Uh, from Sweden. Oh, yeah. Yeah, probably is, yeah, that's easier, but makes yeah. it easier to get them okay. here, but yeah. not, but go feel free. Yeah. Go nuts. I think so I there are two people. So mm. one is like Galina Shubina. Yeah. Uh, because I think she's doing amazing work on maturity of AI, so for, mm. for, for Sweden. Um if I want to think internationally, I would love to see uh Timnit Gibru here. Okay. Uh, Timnit uh, is uh, one of the frontiers of uh, um, responsible AI and oh, uh, uh, interpretable AI. So I, I would really love to uh, see her mm. uh, getting featured here. Is she in Europe or where? Uh, where US. She? US. Okay. Yeah. Great. Yeah. Maybe we can do a roadshow, take the whole thing, set it up in <laughs> LA for a month. Yeah. So with COVID, if you want to do it in person, I don't know, like you know, how yeah. much feasible that is. But uh, yeah. 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 Cool. Awesome. Thanks again, Shahar. It's a true pleasure, and uh, I hope that we can continue some of the discussions we hadn't uh, time for. Yeah. So uh, yeah. that's the fortunate month, thing of being here. Now we can continue <laughs> the topics we missed. Yeah, yeah, it's uh, it's uh, thanks for having me here, mm-hmm. and uh, it was really fun conversation, and I think we can continue having uh, further discussions around those. Cool.
Thank you very much. Thank you Thanks. very much.